It's been a busy Emmy season for Marcelo Zarvos, the composer of The Romanoffs, Ray Donovan, The Affair, just to name a few. I'm Zach Laws of Gold Derby, and with me now is Marcelo Zarvos, a composer of all those shows and more. Uh, so, Marcelo, let's just start off with uh, The Romanoffs, because that was something that was uh, brand new for you. You uh, composed music for the episode entitled Panorama. Right. Uh, talk a little bit about um, what you thought when you first read the script for this. You know, um, well, you know, I'm a huge Matt Weiner fan. So, you know, the first thing I thought it was like an opportunity to work with Matt Weiner was like, you know, he really is for me one of the really great storytellers in television today. And I'm a huge Mad Men fan. And, and you know, they, they, I kind of pursued it pursued that show without realizing that they were looking for somebody kind of like me. Uh, I didn't even realize that there was a show that took place, one of the episodes took place in Mexico or anything like that, and that it was, you know, they were looking for a Latin American composer. And But it kind of both things, you know, I missed that they were looking for me and they didn't realize I was looking for them. But uh, I finally met with, with Matt and the editors and the producer, one of the producers in Cutting Room. So I didn't really read a script, but I watched sequences of the episode at first, and I was I just loved it and really responded to it. And um, and it was an interesting um, what Matt was looking for. First of all, you know, this it's really a movie. I feel like those are all self-contained movies, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it was a incredible effort that Matt did of just writing and directing all of those and. He really had his hands full with with this, and I think working on with different composers was even, I think, another level of complexity. Uh, but I think he was looking for each of the stories to be really, really unique and kind of have its own take. And uh, the first thing that I thought when I watched it was like, I must work on this. I really love it, and and uh, we got along very well. And I gave him some suggestions of some temp music that they might try of some of my other scores and. And then it was a very fast process, two weeks beginning to end of getting everything done and um, and very rewarding ultimately. You mentioned that he was looking for a composer of your specific background. Can you just explain a little bit why from a, a story standpoint uh, that was important to him? Yeah, he wanted, you know, this this episode is, is really a love letter to Mexico City. Now I'm Brazilian, I'm, I'm not Mexican, but I'm Latin America. I've worked on a lot of, Latin American theme projects. Uh, and he, I think it was important to him to have somebody that kind of had understood the flavor, even although he didn't really want something specifically Mexican. In a way, he almost wanted a more Hispanic, Spanish sounding thing because it really was not about the music, was not scoring contemporary Mexico. The music is scoring this dreamer, poet. Uh, that is able the, the the lead character and who's a very idealistic very romantic uh guy journalist who wants to be a poet and sound more like really classical latin american or spanish music and and that's what he wanted the score to convey and the songs and the sort of the more of the local source conveys more of like the contemporary you know, Mexican sound of the show. It's interesting because, you know, this uh, entire series um, concerns people who uh, believe they are descended from the Romanov family, a yeah. prominent Russian family. So there's a whole other layer of uh, cultural complexity. Was that something that was even uh, like brought up uh, as, as an attempt or? Well, you know, it was, I mean, everybody knew about the show, including myself. And I was very curious, you know, when I started to watch and it was like, you have to really, in the end, I feel like he was using the Romanovs as, as, a, as a metaphor for, for privilege and class and all of these other things that he wanted to talk about. And, you know, if you don't pay attention, you miss the Romanov, you know, mention on, on, on this story. You know, it goes by pretty fast. And, and, but certainly not in terms of like anything that would sound Russian. That was, that was not really important. I think he was very focused on the locale of the show, which was Mexico City. And that's what he wanted the music to reflect, again, in this more idealistic kind of romantic way. But nevertheless, Russian music never really came up or anything sounding like that, other than, of course, the main titles, which is is common to all of the episodes uh, and, of the show. Right. Uh, could you delve in a little bit more about how uh, you captured that kind of romanticism in your music? 
Yeah, we used, uh, there was a lot of guitar. He was very keen on guitar. And there's also a, a source piece that is very important that is there, uh, a classical piece uh, that he wanted me to be aware of, uh, not to be in the same style. But we tried a few things for the beginning, for the, the, for the first cue. And when I finally zeroed in on this very Spanish sounding theme uh, with, with classical guitar and some woodwinds and harp, he really, he really dug. I mean, he liked that it sounded more sort of timeless. I think that was a thing that he wanted to sound Latin, but timeless at the same time. And, and we really, really was, the hard thing was finding that first theme for the opening when we first see that character. And even that is very Matt Weiner like in the, the irony of the scene, you have this guy talk, you know, reciting poetry basically, but about the, finding the, his great love, but he's looking on Tinder, so he's kind of swiping on, you know, and, and, but the music does not score, in that case, anything that is on the screen, it's scoring how, how Abel sees himself as this kind of hero, you know, I mean, I, even the other day, somebody was talking about, there's something almost like Don Quixote, like about him, of like this, and I, and I feel like I, I did not think about that at the time, but when somebody pointed, I was like, you know, he definitely has a lot of Don Quixote in him and this idea of finding the damsel in distress and saving her. And, and, and the music is really scoring the idea he has of himself as opposed to who he actually is in real life. Uh, and, and I should say, you know, he falls in love with this mysterious uh, woman. Uh, can you talk a bit about um, the music that you wrote specifically uh, for her? Yes. The first time we, we he sees her, and he really uh, um, kind of falls in love with her. We have a, 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 a reprise of the theme from the opening. But then we also, um, I, I wrote another piece that was also a guitar piece, a little, a lot simpler, that was about their actual relationship. I think the first time he sees her, she fulfills this, this kind of damsel in distress kind of thing that he's looking for. And like she has a sick son and you know she's beautiful and she's you know in a desperate situation but then he also starts to really fall in love with her just i mean she's a beautiful woman and 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 he's very attracted to her as well so we at first it's more of the idealistic love and then it becomes sort of the romantic him trying to seduce her right yeah um you mentioned how this was basically like uh scoring a feature, which you've done uh, a lot of those mm. uh, in the past and a lot this year as well. Um, can you just talk a bit about how that was a different experience um, for a television show uh, doing it like that, as opposed to say your work on like Ray Donovan or The Affair? Yeah, I, I in my mind, when I was working on it, I, I treated it like a film because, you know, if he had asked me to say, okay, listen, I want you to really think of what's going on musically in the other episodes or anything like, but it, there was none of that on the contrary. So I gave myself permission, said, you know what? I'm scoring a Matt Weiner film right now. And, and, and that's how I thought of it. So, um, you know, many years ago, when I first started working on TV, I started doing this, uh, did a number of, of TV movies for HBO. And I remember asking, um, Evian clean, who's the music executive of HBO at the time saying, Hey, Evian, do we do anything different about this because it's TV? And I remember Evan said, no, just do it like a film. And I've taken that to heart in a lot of what I do for TV, but particularly in this case, I was like, no, this is a movie and it's self-contained and we're going to try to get the most lushness and complexity out of the music that, you know, the picture can take. And it was V very much in my mind, I treated it like a movie and, and, and uh, a TV movie or but a movie nevertheless. Right. Speaking of uh, your shows, Ray Donovan and, and The Affair, you're also uh, being considered for that too. Um, the episodes I believe you're submitting are Never Gonna Give Up from Ray Donovan and uh, 408 from mm -hmm. The Affair. Can you just talk a bit about uh, musically what stood out about those uh, particular episodes? Yeah. For Never Gonna Give You Up is probably might be the most music score heavy episode that we've ever done for for Ray Donovan. It was really um, almost like wall to wall, which is not characteristic. Usually 
we have a lot longer stretches with no music and also a lot of shorts. But this episode, even before the season started, or right when they were writing, David Hollander, the showrunner, said, you know, when we get to this episode, you're going to have to to carry this thing. You know, you really, the score needs to drive it. So I was preparing for it like the whole season. And when it came, I really, we really scored it. It, it, it has kind of like this pulse because it really is like a, almost, it, it's, it's a action that takes place in one night when Ray's is frantically looking for his daughter who's been kidnapped. And, and the music really has to carry the episode in a way that it was designed that way. You know, sometimes people ask you to fix things or whatever. It was, certainly was not the case there. It was just that he wanted it to have that almost like a thriller-like, relentless uh, sort of presence of the music and, and also a darkness that, you know, the hero is coming, but, you know, in Ray Donovan, the hero is never just, uh, you know, a knight in a shining armor. I mean, he's a flawed character and how the Donovans are. And, you know, we deal a lot with their the Donovans' violence and their kind of, uh, throughout the season, uh, you you know, Ray's kind of trying to change his ways and the family, but they always end up kind of right back in the center of like a real firestorm. And, and the music is really all about just Ray will stop at nothing. And he talks to the character. He said, you know, I won't stop. I'm going to, you know, I'll kill everybody if I need to, you know, in order to get my daughter back. And the music needed to be right there, right there with him. Right. And for the affair, 408? Yeah, for the affair, this was, you know, I guess the show has been around, you know, I mean, the, the, the episode aired long enough that I can safely, you know, right. give, give the spoiler that, you know, Allison was, you know, the co-lead of the show and the reason why it all started dies uh in 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 the season she's killed and this episode is the episode after the killing when her ex both ex-husbands uh go to record to 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 recognize the body in the morgue and it's a very very emotional especially for cole you know who's really her her first husband who never really got over her you know he never he's still clearly in love with her and he's still and you know he was in in the in the this season before he finds her body he had finally decided that he was going to leave his wife and tell Allison how he felt and was just ready like kind of brushes his hair puts a clean shirt and is ready to kind of say hey you're really the love of my life and then that punch in the stomach happens and it was really very characteristic of the affair of where the music really is very internal and really is very restrained so it's an extremely emotional scene but the, but we wanted and i wanted the music to to really stay stay away from melodrama as much as possible because it was such an emotionally charged moment and you know it's a scene where the you know the the your beloved is laying on a morgue and it's it's it couldn't be any sadder than that. And so the music kind of goes to this other place of just shock and it's kind of darkness and anger and all these other feelings that, that come up as opposed to sadness. It's almost like we don't have time for sadness until the very end of the episode uh, when we finally take a breath and, um, and Noah's character is in a diner and he kind of sees somebody he thinks it might be Allison or he has a vision and, and that's when we finally say, okay, we can be sad now. But before that, it's just shock and anger, confusion, and just disbelief of, of what they're looking. And the music is very abstract in that way. I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, the, your work on the upcoming Muhammad Ali documentary, uh, What's My Name? Can you tell us a bit uh, just about working on that? Yes, uh, that was an absolute incredible experience. I just... I love Antoine Fuqua. We've worked on Brooklyn's Finest before, and I'm just a big fan of his. And and it's a very special documentary, unlike any documentary I've ever seen, because he really, it's Ali telling his own story, but without the benefit of like, okay, we're sitting down with Ali, he's now going to remember how he wants to remember. It's 
it's him throughout his life because he was so filmed, he was filmed and recorded and and interviewed so many times. And so we we kind of go, there's not that thing of like, oh, it's Ali in the end of his life looking back. It's Ali during his life, looking at his own life. And um, it's very exciting musically because um, Antoine wanted us to score the fights like action sequences. And at first I was like, really, are you sure it's a documentary? There's always this thing on documentaries that the music is supposed to kind of traditionally stay more behind and not get too dramatic but Antoine was like no these are this these fights are dramatic they're cut like dramatic fight sequences he of course was coming out of you know a couple of years ago doing uh southpaw which was a boxing movie so he had very clear ideas of how he wanted to portray that and for me I brought in my background as a composer of, of modern dance which is something I've done a lot you know earlier in my career, and I treated those as action sequences and also as a dance piece, because what Ali is doing is, you know, he's a brutal fighter, the greatest that ever lived. He's also incredibly graceful and incredibly uh, uh, just musical in how he, how he fought and how he moved, how he talked. Uh, and so that was really kind of my favorite part of it was scoring all those fights, beginning with the really dramatic ones and when he was winning, but also towards the end when he really is losing. And, and we know now in retrospect when he was getting, you know, really beaten savagely by Leo Spinks for sure, for, for instance, we know what that was doing to his brain, you know, and, and so it becomes almost like the music is almost horror-like by the end of this long journey, there's a three-hour film two 90 minute segments and is he was just i kept thinking of him like you know this is a hero movie it's not a superhero movie he doesn't have a cape he's mortal but he's the hero in the traditional sense that he fought he believed for what he you know believed in what he believed in kept fighting kept getting up like a hero and in the end sacrificed himself for a greater cause he went even past his prime when he really should have stopped he kept fighting so he could keep earning money and could could keep helping all the different causes that he helped. And so I, I, I feel like it was it was a hero movie, you know, and in this day and age when, when superhero movies are so omnipresent and and they're amazing what what's out there, this was an opportunity to score a real life hero, which for me and for a lot of the world is what you know and who Muhammad Ali was. I certainly look forward to watching that, which I should say. Uh, it will have already aired by the time this interview becomes published because it's airing Great. tonight. <laughs> it's airing tonight. That's correct. And I hope people will check it out. It's it's a very special and a really fun ride. Absolutely. Uh, before I let you go, I just wanted to ask you, uh, you know, you're a two-time Emmy nominee for your work on You Don't Know Jack and uh, Taking Chance. That was like right at the beginning of your career. So, I mean, what did that, um, what did that do for you in terms of um, you know, uh, helping boost your confidence, helping you get work. Uh, what did that mean for you? I think the first one is the most important that you mentioned, boosting my confidence. You know, getting nominated twice that early on was like, whoa, you know, wow. I, I mean, I couldn't even believe it. You know, I mean, that 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 happened. You know, it was so fast. And, and uh, it really it really helped me, you know, help my career in, in very in, in po powerful ways of, you know, and this was... The beginning of also this kind of golden age of television. I feel like I was kind of just coming in as as TV was being transformed into a whole other medium. A lot of it had to do with HBO, of course, and then followed by many other networks, Showtime, and everybody else. But yeah, it was it was a real game changer for me, and I'm always very very grateful to have had that honor, you know, that early. Well, Marcelo, it's always a pleasure talking with you. Thanks so much for your time. Likewise, like thanks thanks so much for having me. Thank you. You're welcome. And thanks to all of you at home for watching. Make sure you uh, click the like and subscribe button below and make sure you visit us at goldderby.com for all the latest Emmy news and to make your predictions.